Our first speaker is Todd Hodges. Todd is a retired engineer from NASA Langley Research Center. He has 40 plus years in VTOL design, development, and testing experience at Langley. Todd was a consultant on the GL10 tilt wing and co-author on, on the GL10 patent. He has a diverse historical knowledge of aeronautical technical disciplines. He works on design and propulsion integration on flight test UAVs and was a consultant on the Puffin VTOL PAV. Todd also researched crashworthy composite structures. He is here today to give us a, a history of VTOL aircraft design. Please welcome Todd Hodges. Okay, I'm going to my, my scope of uh, the talk here. I'm going to talk uh, VTOL history and from the, primarily from the perspective of what we call the wheel of misfortune. And you can, you can see, a, a, well, I have it on the slides too, but you can see uh, in this uh, graphic here that, oh, you're not supposed to wander from this microphone, right? And I'm going to uh, uh, go over some general configurations, uh, considerations, and uh, finally a kind of a, a rules of thumb uh, for VTOL designs. This was the original wheel. This was done in the 70s by McDonnell Douglas St. Louis. And uh, it in, included uh, aircraft in which hardware had actually been constructed, but it also included designs where they, they had only done paper studies and, and no actual hardware. Now later, Centra Corporation did this uh, wheel, and uh, this they, they, they pared it down so that it only included vehicles in which there was actual hardware built. Now, the wheel, the inner part of this wheel here is the type of propulsion system, okay, uh, different categories. This second uh, group uh, or second circle in here is how that propulsion system uh, generates forces and moments to do flight. Why be interested in VTOL history? As the saying, the old saying goes, if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat its mistakes, okay? So we want to avoid uh, avoidable uh, mistakes that have been made in the past and, uh, you know, so we don't have to repeat them again. Good knowledge of history will lower the cost of your development, shorten the development schedule, because, you know, why not start where others have left off? Why repeat their mistakes? You know, run over the same potholes, run down the same uh, blind alleys. Now, uh, I, I will say that conventional takeoff and landing aircraft, CTOL, as we say, is mostly a well-known science for the most part. However, I would argue that VTOL aircraft design is still very much a black art. And the reason for that is the complexity of the flows, the structural systems complexities, okay? There's a lot of different ways uh, for VTOL design to bite you. Now, just as an example, just to give you a flavor of what can go wrong in the VTOL world, I just uh, have this one ex example here. Um, this is a typical, you know, reasonable looking helicopter. You know, we've been doing helicopters for over 70 years. We should, you'd think we would know what we're doing by now, right? So anyway, this helicopter was a little different in that 
to get the blades to have certain characteristics, okay, they really thickened up the roots of the blades, okay? Now, a Robinson helicopter, you're talking a, a, a blade root, you know, about that thick, okay? Other helicopters, you know, thicker, depending on the size of the, the blades and everything. This one had a really much thicker blade root. And the effect of that is that it created a huge amount of turbulence in this uh, blade attachment hub region. And you can see, you know, the, the thicker sections there. Now, helicopters have always had this problem where the, these, this is uh, some CFD done on uh, hubs. And you can see, you know, the, the level of vorticity and, and all the complicated flow uh, the, the eddies, the little vortices, and, and different features of the turbulent flow coming off of this hub, okay, and it convects across the tail. Okay, this is a traditional, this has always been a problem in the helicopter industry. However, because this helicopter had five blades, which is, you know, more than usual, which means it also has five pitch links. It has five uh, uh, dampers and, you know, and everything, plus the greatly increased thickness, okay, in that hub area. So this created much more than usual uh, uh, turbulence coming back and going across the tail. The effect of this is it effectively lowered the dynamic pressure over the tail, okay? Now, it, the aircraft was designed to be statically stable, okay? But due to the, the, the level of turbulence, okay, off of this, you know, kind of unusual hub blade arrangement, the, the de reduction in dynamic pressure was large, okay? and on this particular helicopter. So um, the amount of turbulence, okay, uh, because of the amount of turbulence uh, over the tail. Now, uh, this aircraft had a SAS system, stability augmentation system, and uh, for a while, they, they didn't even know that this aircraft was statically unstable because the SAS system was making up for the lack of stability, was uh, giving it artificial stability. So the, the ramification of that is that in, in um, now this vehicle had about 100 hours on it, okay? And they were no, already noticing, and 100 hours in the life of an airframe is nothing, okay? And, but they had noticed that the anti-torque uh, fan, tail fan, was already developing fatigue cracks, okay? Okay, 100 hours on the airframe, and we got fatigue already, okay? So uh, I thought, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, that, uh, and it left the, you know, the people scratching their heads. But I, I, I uh, pretty well thought, uh, pretty well convinced that the reason for this is the stability augmentation system had been pounding that tail pan, okay? You know, you know high cycle usage, uh, you know, to make up for the lack of static stability on the basic airframe. So, that's, you know, I'm get, you know, kind of trying to give you a flavor of the things that can go wrong in VTOL design, all right? So what do they do? They put on uh, end plates on the tail, okay? And here, here's the original tail, and then here's the um, modification with the end plates, okay? Original tail modified end plates, okay? This helped. Now, now why put uh, end plates 
uh, on the end of the t horizontal tail. The reason for that is it gets more tail volume in clean air, all right, and away from all this turbulence and uh, dynamic uh, pressure reduction. And it worked, okay? However, what did it do? It added weight to the tail, all right? So the, the aircraft now is tail heavy. The, the CG is in the wrong place, all right? Another thing that happened, although it you know, solved the static stability problem, um, uh, 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 what it did do is now they were getting fatigue cracks where the vertical tail attached to the top of the fan housing, okay? Now they were getting cracks there, okay? Structural cracks. And uh, so you, you can see this cascade of effects that, that can get you in VTOL design. Okay, so I just, I just show you, a, you know, an, an example of this. Um, what finally saved the, the whole vehicle was total redesign of the tail. Okay, now I'm going to uh, take these uh, uh, pieces of the, uh, of the wheel and, and go into the various types, uh, propulsion types, and then what, how that propulsion type created, uh, you know, the forces and moments for the, you know, actual aircraft. And I, I'm going to, uh, you know, just quickly review uh, you know, some of the things that, uh, uh, or some of the aircraft that have been designed over the years. Now this, this uh, two-thirds of the wheel is, has the, the same propulsion system is used for hover and forward flight. And this is, uh, uh, generally leads to fewer engines, fewer components, and in general is uh, very weight and cost efficient, okay, when you use the, the, the same propulsion system for both hover and cruise flight. Out of this uh, uh, group here, okay, most of the really successful VTOLs have come from, okay. And, you know, there's a reason for that. This is an efficient way to go. The Harrier uh, is down here. The V-22 is over here. And, um, uh, this, you know, like I said, this is, uh, you know, one of the more successful uh, segments of the VTOL wheel. Now, you'll notice uh, there's a whole lot of tilting of things in this segment, okay? Whether they tilt rotors or they tilt wings or they tilt a fan or, or whatever, okay? There's a you know, whole lot of tilting going on. Now, for engines and gearboxes, I I'll make a proviso here. For internal combustion engines and gearboxes, Okay, this, this tilting means you have to qualify and certify uh, that your lubrication system uh, works for all angles of operation. Okay, now you, you know, might say, well, that doesn't sound very bad, very complicated. Well, it turns out it is. <laughs> okay, turns out this, is, this can get pretty expensive. And uh, it's, it's not just a matter of uh, adding a couple more oil pickups, okay? It's, uh, it, it's, it's more involved, expensive, and, uh, uh, you know, to do than, than you, you know, you would think. Okay, so some of that, uh, some of the vehicles in that segment, okay, starting out in the early 50s, uh, you had the Transcendental 
mid to late 50s, uh, into the 60s, you had these aircraft, uh, you know, through here and, and here. And uh, to give you, an, uh, you know, more examples of the type of things that can go on in VTOL design, the XV3 had an aeroelastic problem in the wings. Okay, they're, they're just uh, with these uh, weights of the rotors at the tips. Okay, it, was, it had an aeroelastic problem. And they solved it by putting reinforcing struts that went from the fuselage, the bottom of the fuselage, out to these pods. Okay, the, 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 the rotor pods here at the end of the wing. So, um, X100 was uh, pretty successful. By the way, the XV3 X100 are in the Smithsonian Institution. They're not on display right now, they're in the storage area. And, uh, but they, you know, they, they, they do have them. And you can get permission to look at these uh, if, you know, if you feel like it. X-19, real interesting, real nice air, airplane. The aeromechanics of that airplane were great. The pilots loved it. It, it, it flew nice, it, it, handling qualities, everything uh, performed well. Now, on the X-19, the engines are on the top side of the aft part of the fuselage. And then the, the power is distributed throughout the, the airframe uh, through gearboxes and shafts, okay? The X, we lost an X-19. Why? A structural dynamic uh, occurred in the power transfer system, and uh, uh, they think they hit, somehow hit a resonant in, in something. And a gearbox and shaft broke, and the aircraft flipped over and crashed. So uh, Doak was pretty successful. Um, had an uh, engine in the center, tur little turbine, and you know, running power out shafts out the wings for uh, a tilt fan. Um, these uh, tilt wings. Uh, uh, research vehicles were uh, fairly successful. This was the first one in the 50s, okay, the, the VZ-2 that tested at NASA Langley Research Center um, by uh, Jack Reeder. And uh, Jack Reeder found that to be a, a real handful. Now this was before they understood the value of keeping the flow attached over the top of the wing through transition, okay? If you don't do that, you're in for a bumpy ride, okay? And they, they finally, you know, they understood that. And uh, after, the, after the VZ2 testing, um, the situation improved quite a bit with the XC142 and improved even more so uh, uh, with the CL-84, uh, Canada Air. Um, the XC-142 also was uh, quite a vibrator, okay? It, it shook, it rattled, and, uh, and, and most of the, you know, especially through transition. And while it improved on the flow separation over the top of the wing, during transition, it didn't completely get rid of it. And, you know, to, to show you again, you know, what can happen in VTOL, uh, Bob Champagne, another Langley test pilot, landed this one day and he had just set the XC-142 down when he felt an odd vibration shudder through the airframe. I mean, you know, I was like, what's that? What, what's, what, what, what's going on here? So he looks out to the wing, and he sees the aileron dangling from the end of the wing, okay? And, uh, you know, just dangling there. You know, it was uh, originally, of course, it was supported at both ends, okay, with fittings. 
Okay, but one of them broke. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's just dangling uh, off on the end of the wing there. And uh, if that had happened, <laughs> you know, a few minutes before, during the flight testing, uh, it, it could easily have uh, crashed the aircraft, okay? As it is, there were five XC-142s uh, built. Out of five, three crashed. And there were numerous hard landings and, uh, and near crashes, okay? And um, uh, by far, uh, Jack Reeder, who the Langley test pilot who flew all of these, okay? Jack Reeder thought the CL-84 was by far the most refined design, okay? The handling qualities were almost carefree. It could, you know, go through transition and back and, and, and you could, you know, rack it around in a turn through transition, you know. Uh, one of the, the traditional problems in, in VTOL designs is somewhere in the envelope, you often find you're lacking control power, okay, at some, at some usually out at the periphery of the flight envelope, okay. But s that's such a big problem, you know, you really need to, Keep an eye on it, because if you're if you don't have the proper control power, you know, at, at certain points in in the flight envelope, you know, it'll crash. <laughs> All right. So, uh, in fact, um, uh, Jack Reeder was flying this uh, XC-142 one day in a in a crosswind situation, and they were they were testing for uh, crosswind performance. And he, he literally r totally ran out of lateral control. Okay, he had the control slam over on the stop this way, and it was still rolling this way. <laughs> All right? So what he did is he punched in rudder and, and got the nose into the wind. Okay, got rid of the crosswind, okay? And, and was able to bring that wing back, okay? But this is typical in VTOLs, okay? There's, you know, certain conditions, you know, of combination of maneuvering and crosswind and, and climb and, and this, that, and the other, and suddenly, oops, I'm out of control power. So this, this is a typical, traditional problem in, in, in VTOL design. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, we're still on that same segment where the, you know, same power system for cruise is in hover. Now, uh, this, this is more uh, of that segment. Uh, I want to just briefly uh, talk about the Harrier. The Harrier is a wonderfully simple aircraft, okay? You look at a lot of VTOLs, and there's a lot of stuff moving, you know? They may be moving the whole wing, or a whole, you know, big rotors, or moving this, or moving that, okay? In the Harrier, you're just moving four nozzles. <laughs> That's it, okay? You got the front nozzles, which are pressurized by the first stages uh, compressor stages of the engine, okay? And the, the rear nozzles, okay? Uh, two nozzles on each side. Um, and the rear nozzles uh, are blown by the jet exhaust, okay? So all you have moving are the nozzles, okay? Simple, small things, okay? And in, in fact, the, the, the Harrier is just a wonderful, simple, robust, reliable design. You, lo you look at those nozzles, if you ever are, are able to get in behind and see what's going on back there, what you'll see is, is where the, the nozzle goes into the side of the fuselage, there's a, a big bearing, okay? 
And on the outside of that is a, just a sprocket, okay? Just like a bicycle, okay? And then they wrap a big, strong uh, bicycle chain around that sprocket and, then, and, and around an electric motor, and that's it, okay? Just, the nozzles just move together, okay? But it, it's, it's, it's simple, it's reliable, robust, and that's one of the reasons why the Harrier is, is such a success. Um, oh, Pogo. I got, uh, I don't, let's see, how am I doing on time? Well, okay. Um, I, I'd like to get into some uh, Pogo stories. I went out uh, when I was working on Puffin, and I went out and talked to Skeets Coleman, who was the test pilot for the Convair Pogo. The Lockheed uh, never were able to convert their tail sitter. They, they never did a full, full transition. Never, were, were never able to do it. Uh, the Convair Pogo was able, okay, but it had certain issues, <laughs> okay? When going out was fine, okay? You just power up and go. Transitioning back from cruise to hover, okay? First you gotta come back on the power and slow down, but then as the angle gets higher and higher, you gotta come back with the power, okay, on pogo. You gotta come back up, okay, so that you can hang it on the prop and hover. Well, what that does is it puts you a few hundred feet in the air, okay? Now you're laying on your back, looking over your shoulder and going, well, how high am I? <laughs> okay, and you have to be very careful easing it down because if you get in the vortex ring state, okay, coming down, okay, it's like crash. It's, it's, you know, it's all over if you, you know, if you get in that uh, vortex ring state. So, uh, as, in a, as Skeet said, it's an exciting, too exciting of an, air, uh, uh, of an airplane to fly. Okay, let's go on, move on to the next segment of the wheel. Okay, this is where the propulsion system for cruise is different from the propulsion system for hover. Okay, they have uh, uh, lift engines, dedicated lift engines, okay, and dedicated cruise engine. All right, and the uh, British SC1, and then there were two, there's the Balzac, and then uh, later on another Mirage, which was a little larger. Now, the characteristics of, of this slice of the wheel, okay, is because of the multiple propulsion systems, okay, even running at idle, okay, um, this uh, fuel consumption on these vehicles is high, really high. They draw fuel like there's no tomorrow. Uh, they tend to be heavy and expensive and uh, a complicated transition. You know, the, the pilot, you know, he's got a, sh you know, flying out, transitioning out to cruise. He's got to shut down the lift engines. He's got to close the doors, you know, power up the thing, and then, and then the whole thing in reverse to transition from cruise back to hover. So anyway, these were uh, complicated transitions, high workload in the pilot. Uh, this, you know, this whole type of uh, vehicle is, uh, tends to be heavy and uh, expensive. Okay, this segment of the wheel, okay, um, shown, uh, here's a cartoon of the VJ-101, and um, here you use the cruise engine, the, the main propulsion system, for both cruise and hover. But in addition, you add 
you know, a little extra, okay, uh, for hover. Okay, a little bit of a dedicated lift engine there. Um, this, uh, again, a comp rather complicated transition. Uh, maybe not as high a fuel consumption as the previous one, but still, still fairly high, still fairly uh, heavy and expensive. And uh, here's some examples of, of that uh, part of the wheel. Now there's a actually one of these uh, actually reached use. Uh, in the Russian military, okay? And that was the Yak-38. It used the main propulsion system, of course, uh, for both crews and VTOL flight. But it had some dedicated uh, lift-only engines for hover, uh, uh, little Russian turbines. The trouble is they failed often. <laughs> on a regular basis. Now this was in service with the Russian Navy for about one to two years and the crash rate was so high that they, they just, you know, after one or two years they just pulled them all out of service because of the reliability or lack of reliability of that uh, Russian lift engine. Now in the West uh, we had a fairly reliable dedicated lift engine that Rolls-Royce made. It was a pretty good engine, okay? Fairly, pretty reliable. The DO-31 used that. Um, it has the uh, four lift engines in each tip pod. And then the, um, the main engines here are like the Harrier, where, you know, it's, it just swivels nozzles, you know, for crews or for vertical flight. Um, this is a uh, German, okay, this had uh, lift engines fore and aft along with Harrier type uh, swiveling uh, main, uh, on the main engine. But the only thing to reach operational status in, you know, in production, operational, was the uh, Russian. Now this final segment on the wheel is uh, augmented power plant for hover. The, this uh, diagram down here in the lower left corner uh, shows you the ducting for the ejector augmenter system, okay? And what, what would happen is they had a, they literally had a plug for the exhaust of the main jet engine. And in cruise, that plug would be forward and the, you know, the uh, exhaust for the jet engine would go around it and out the back and you know, provide the thrust for, uh, for cruise. However, when you went vertical, that plug moved to seal off the exhaust pipe of that jet engine and then force all the hot gases out into ducts, okay, that, that, that ran out the wings, okay, and ran forward to the front wings, okay, and where it created lift uh, using an ejector augmenter system. This was also tested in hover at NASA Langley. And what they found out it, they, they couldn't figure out, they, they, they you know, all the calcul all the subscale testing that worked out, everything worked out fine. They designed the, got the, the uh, permission to go forward with the actual full scale demonstrator and everything. And, you know, everything was looking good. And then they built the full scale demonstrator and it wouldn't do nothing. Okay, it wouldn't even lift itself off the, off the ground. As it turns out, uh, they had uh, made an error, <laughs> okay, in the ducting in the wings, okay, 
and they did not get even flow out the ejector um, slots, okay? They had uneven flow. They had more flow on the inboard and, and, uh, and it was starved for flow on the outboard portions. So they didn't, they didn't uh, create the turning vanes and everything to get the flow uniform down that slot or, or you know, what, what the uh, design called for because the wings are tapered some. So there, there's some differences running down the wing. But anyway. Uh, so they, they, they put it up in the, in the um, gantry at NASA Langley, tested it, you know, no lift, even, even hauling it. They thought at first it was a ground effect problem and they hauled it up and in the gantry, still no lift. <laughs> or not as much lift as they were supposed to be getting. So, and they finally did some real detailed testing and then found this problem with the uh, distribution of the, of the flow in the slots for the ejector aug augmenter system. Okay. Here you can see on the back view on the XFV12, you can see the plug that actually uh, seals in, in uh, vertical flight, seals the exhaust of that jet engine and sends all the hot gases out into the ducts. Um, as, as found in the ejector augmenter systems as well as boundary layer control systems for drag reduction, it, it, you, in, in both cases you find where just a little mistake in the ducting, in, in, you know, just you know, getting the flow to go through a turn or you know, some little mistake somewhere and then the, the things fall apart. This was um, wing fans and a, and a fan here. This uh, took the hot gases from the jet engine and uh, took them to these uh, where the hot gases drove these fans at the periphery, okay, and, and drove these uh, lift fans. And it worked not real good, but Anyway, of course, the F-35 is a good success. It, it draws shaft power off of the engine uh, in, in vertical, in hovering, okay? Draws shaft power as well as swiveling the exhaust nozzle of the jet engine straight down. Um, and then this uh, very highly loaded fan uh, just behind the cockpit. Um, you know, it's just driven by shaft power off the, off the jet engine. And then uh, once they're to cruise flight, that's totally declutched, okay, and the fan stops, you know, and, um, and it, you know, it's, it's working. Okay, let's look at candidate configurations, okay? Um, configuration selection, is dependent on your mission requirements, obviously. Uh, range, payload, hover time, speed, endurance, okay? Now, if you wanna go fast, you tend to be pushed down into this region, okay? Very, you know, high disk loadings, okay? If you're just hovering enough to take it off or, and then land it at the end of the mission, Okay, you don't need much hovering. Then, then you'll, you'll get kind of pushed down into this area. If you need to do a lot of hovering, then you're gonna get pushed up into this area in, in these types of lower disc loading configurations. Okay, lower disc loading here, higher, higher there. So it's this balance between, in your mission requirements, it's this balance between hovering, how much hovering you have to do, and how much uh, forward speed and everything you want. Uh, uh, it, that, that determines, you know, which configuration you're driven to, okay? 
Veto rules of thumb. Veto is going to cost more to buy, operate, and maintain. Period. Okay? You really got to want to hover. Okay? Because it's going to cost you. It's, and uh, development schedule is longer than C tolls. Okay? They're, they're more complicated. Um, because of uh, most VTOL configurations have substantial amounts of separated flow and nonlinear aerodynamics, uh, it makes their analysis difficult. Okay? They're, they're uh, very challenging and things are often missed. <laughs> Stability control handling qualities. Like I, I said before, you're generally going to find a control power problem somewhere in your flight envelope. So you're all, you know, always, you know, watch out for that, you know, because that's that's a high probability of that happening. Human factors issues in cockpit design are more involved. Okay, the. Uh, these vehicles often go through, you know, large excursions uh, in angle, deck angle, flight deck uh, angle. And so, you, you know, have to have good sight lines uh, throughout the whole flight envelope. The V-22 uh, design group spent over a year designing the thrust lever for the V-22. Okay, why? Because they wanted the pilot, just by holding on to the thrust lever, knowing and the feel of it and where it was, they wanted the human factors, they, they wanted the pilot to, you know, understand, you know, what the state of his aircraft was. Okay? Intuitively. <laughs> All right? Without having to read a lot of dials, okay? They, they, they wanted it to be very intuitive, and they actually spent over a year designing the thrust lever to get it right, to have the right human factors, okay, and feel throughout the flight envelope, okay. Actually spent over a year doing that. Structural dynamic issues, often an issue, often a problem, okay. You have flutter and panel uh, vibrations and, you know, all kinds of things can go on and happen when you have, you know, the complicated machinery and complicated flow over it, in okay. case. Material fatigue, okay? Material fatigue issues are always lurking in the background, <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's brought down a lot of VTOLs, <laughs> all right? Uh, even the CL84, which is probably the finest refinement in tilt wing design, the, on the CL84 you have the uh, transmission and you got the prop rotor, okay? And then on the back of the transmission is the attachment to the wing. All right, and then the, the engine is underslung and then drives the, you know, the power comes up. Okay. Um, the case for the transmission cracked on the CL84. Okay, and, uh, and eventually the crack grew and they did, didn't notice it, uh, couldn't inspect for it. Maybe it's the origin of the crack was on the inside of the case, you know, whatever, and um, the prop rotor departed the airframe and it crashed, okay? So, you know, watch out for material fatigue issues. Now, before, you know, I get too depressing, okay, there's a real bright spot coming, okay, and it's electric propulsion, okay? A lot of these issues like the, the tilting and getting the oils 
lubrication system right with an internal combustion engine, uh, much of that disappears with the electric VTOL. Okay? So, uh, electric VTOL, the, the primary characteristic is no matter what size the engine, you can have a small electric motor to a huge electric motor, and the efficiency, you, you can design a 94, 95, 96% efficient electric motor throughout that whole uh, range of powers from you know small motors out to big powers, okay? That's not the case with internal combustion engines, okay? There are regions, you know, where the piston engine is best, and then there's a region where turbo shaft is best, and then there's a region turbo fan, okay, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm getting the high sign, I'll go fast. <laughs> okay, so what's the electric propulsion gonna do? It's gonna blow open the VTOL design space and make it better, okay? And, and, and this like digital, uh, not digital, uh, distributed electric propulsion, you know, that's, that's like the first shot, okay? But there's other stuff coming in the, in the pipeline. Oh, also power to weight ratio. You have small motor, huge motor, and, and the, the power to weight ratio throughout that whole range is, is close, almost the same, so. Okay, um, plans for next year. What I, what I plan to do is now, now that I've gone over the overall uh, wheel of misfortune, now I'm gonna pick a slice Okay, and do a, a deep dive on uh, characteristics, um, successes, failures, lessons learned, you know, advantages, disadvantages of the, the various configurations and what to watch out for. Okay, so uh, I, I'm thinking next year, my thoughts are tilt wings and tilt rotors. Okay, questions. I threw these up here uh, last Monday. <laughs> Electric VTOL is coming. Man, is it coming. Okay, it is exploding. Okay, to the point where <laughs> this is uh, Aston Martin, you know, the car company. That's their VTOL. <laughs> PA, personal air vehicle. Okay, there's the Rolls Royce. I just found out about those last Monday. <laughs> okay, there's rumors Audi car company is uh, doing something. There's, you know, Mercedes Benz. Maybe. Well, where's, uh, but yeah, you're, gonna, you're probably gonna go over all of this here next. Okay, so any time for questions or, or you, you can always talk to me afterwards, so. Okay, sorry. <laughs> but electric VTOL is coming, and it's, it's really going to improve a lot of things in the VTOL world. Thank you.